Welcome, everyone, to DEI After Five, the show that focuses on topics across diversity, equity, and inclusion with some of the brightest minds in the industry. Here's your hostess, inclusive culture curator and coach, Sasha Thompson. Hey everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of DEI After Five. So this is a topic that we touched on in season one a little bit, um, but you know, with everything going on in the world around us over the last few years, I thought that it would be great to re-look at um, this this conversation and, and really think about it from a more global context. Um, and so what I'm talking about is intersectionality and, and just how we do this work of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, with a lens of intersectionality, with the lens of globalization, with the lens of colonization and the impacts of all of those things and, and how we show up and do this work. And so today my guest is Jod Evangelo Nasser and a, a, a professor, a consultant, all the things um, kind of in this space. And so Jody Vangelo, I want to welcome you to the show. Hey, Sasha, how are you? I'm doing well. So for those that may not know who you are, can you just give us a little bit of background on who you are and how you got into this work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, so my name is Jody Vangelo Nasser, um, Jody Vangelo. Uh, is what people call me. Um, I'm global inclusion and cross-cultural strategist. That is kind of, that's my title. And that is actually like my specialty and that I mm -hmm. hone in on in the DEI realm, but also in philanthropy, in the social justice space, in the social equity space, um, in higher education, in academia, in marketing, in communications and film as well. Um, I consider myself to be a globalist, um, a multilingual, uh, professional who hones in on the four, three pillars uh, within DEI work, which is global inclusion, the understanding of how do we include global narratives and global identities in the spectrum of the United States or other cosmopolitan cities such as the UK or Canada, for example, um, taking into consideration the immigrant experience, mm -hmm. the other country, the foreign experience, Mm -hmm. um, the second pillar is intersectionality, um, and I give a lot of ode and thanks to um, uh, highly well-known scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, who amplified the term intersectionality, and I believe that because of her amplification and her advocacy for that term, there is a sense of urgency of understanding the multiple elements of identity. It was started at the foundation of Black women as an example and the atrocities and challenges they face in the United States, and it's very important to understand that background, but also how do we expand that into understanding other intersectionalities, taking into consideration cores such as blackness and queerness and womanhood and gender and sexual orientation and all these things. Um, and the third pillar is cross-cultural practices, which is um, actually um, kind of an issue that I've seen here in the United States as an immigrant who came to the US seven years ago as a student and now um, uh, a working professional, um, I've noticed that there's a, not a lot of like cross-cultural interactions or understanding of the differences of cultural thinking between individuals from multiple backgrounds. There's more of a wall and more of a segregated mentality, which is kind of understandable given the history of slavery in this country. You know, segregative mentalities, you know, are based out of like redlining and Jim Crow laws have been happening in this country like years ago. They remain today within the mentality in mm -hmm. corporate America, in higher education, in philanthropy, the idea of divide, the idea mm -hmm. of separating groups, the idea of like, yes, we're multicultural, but the cultures don't, you know, mess around with each other at all. Like everyone's in their own corner. And cross-culturalism is the idea of like, you know, how do we intersect and understand our differences given colonial history, given modern day, um, presence given how white supremacy has placed us as groups as marginalized individuals but also our connectivity how diaspora connects us how history of diaspora and colonial history 
connects us. So I embody these three pillars in my line of work because I feel they're very necessary and they're foundational, especially in DEI work. And I feel like a challenge that I've seen in DEI is that like it tends to be superficial, hitting surface level, very corporate, very lip service and not foundational. And a challenge I will tell you from now is that like, you know, when you speak up and try to be radical and globally inclusive, that voice tends to be shut down and minimized. Exactly. Yeah. So right now I have my own consultancy, a JE Cultural Consulting, where I consult with clients, corporations, doing public talks on those three pillars. Um, I partner with the National Center for Civil and Human Rights as a DI facilitator. I'm also on their board, advisory board member at their institute. Um, and I teach at uh, five colleges and now newly Morris Brown College in the, in the spring. So very excited to be working with an HBCU, as well as developing my film, uh, Once Upon a Color, that is live on Amazon Prime Video um, and being published on the Black Wall Street Times. Just giving, you know, just a little... I was just like, so so you're not doing much of anything, pretty no, much, no. I'm hearing. <laughs> a, little, a, little, a little arrogant sprinkle because, you know, it's America, it's capitalism. We talked about it. I mean, got to show up a little bit. I mean, so people don't think... Just I'm a little. Like, you know, like, do a little you know, something. I'm not like a DEI educator just like walked on the street and suddenly became, you know, like, you know, I have the work speaks for itself. People can yes, my which I appreciate. Yes. And I want to make sure that like, you know, this is not just talking to talk, but this is like passion and credentialed yeah. passion, if you want. Yeah. So that's where I am right now. And I'm very grateful for you, Sasha, to bring me on and actually like understanding that these topics, these pillars need to be talked about. So thank you for having me. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, it's just when we first spoke, um, I, I t tend to like, you know, write a little bit of notes here and there just so to jog my memory of, of people. And you should see my notes. Like they're all over the place because there's just so much that, that you know, you touch on. And one of the things, and I, I want to kind of work my way backwards uh, mm -hmm. as to why I really thought it was important for us to have this conversation. Um, around the cross-cultural practices, right? Mm -hmm. And just being an immigrant to the country and, and seeing it from that lens. And what a lot of people don't necessarily know or realize about me was I was an immigrant to this country, mm -hmm. right? I, I came as a toddler. So most of my life was, I was here in the United States, but with a lens of a family that was very much Caribbean. Oh, which part of the Caribbean? You didn't tell me that. Oh, I didn't tell you that. So I was born in Barbados. My dad's side is from Barbados. My mother's side is from St. Vincent. Okay. Okay. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Yes. That's, I, mean, I told you, you know, like I have intersection with Haiti from my father's side, but that's amazing. Yeah. It's, it's wonderful to acknowledge that. But yes, tell me more. So, you know, so, so a part of that has been this, and I talked to, I have a cousin um, who's been doing this work for years. She's retired. Um, but just talking about that cultural lens and having that very different background and foundation and what that looks like in the United States and some of the challenges that that may come up when you start to speak up um, mm -hmm. on things that may not necessarily align with the values or how you've seen the world. Um, and so, so much of my childhood, I recall running into these issues and challenges. Um, so much of my childhood, the first time I was called the N-word, I was in kindergarten. Wow. Um, and coming home to say that to my mom, right? Who, again, as an immigrant to this country, comes from a predominantly Black country where she was like, we didn't have to deal with this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so now it's that fast learning and education so saying all that to say, you know, when I started working, it was a very different lens of work mm. because again, being raised here in the United States and seeing kind of the American way of doing things, but then also seeing and understanding and listening to family on how their work experience has been. Um, and then some of the challenges they face coming to the United States as adults mm -hmm. coming into corporate America, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's I, I totally understand and, and see that need for those cross-cultural um, communications because I look and, you know, one of my mom's best friends at work was Italian, mm -hmm. um, a very fiery Italian woman that we absolutely loved. And 
she was just like, because I never knew to not be friends with people of other cultures because I've always had that around me. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that whole segregation of, oh, you're not supposed yeah. to. So she didn't have that. Right. So when when I hear you talk about not just being multicultural, but understanding that cross cultural communication, mm-hmm. can you talk a bit about um one, what are the benefits of that in the workplace? Because I think that even though folks believe or see like, oh, we have all these folks, you know, we have diversity in the workplace, Mm -hmm. um, but that's not enough. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about like, what are truly some of the benefits of having that cross-cultural connection? Absolutely. I mean, well, I will say the number one thing is friendship. Let me, I'm going to give it right straight up. Like, you know, you can develop beautiful friendships from cross-cultural interactions. Like, um, I will give my example, like, you know, coming to the U.S. Uh, on a student visa, you did my master's and then you started working, you know, um, like, and my master's program, like, you know, 80% of the students were international. I'm talking about like, you know, from African, mm-hmm. Caribbean, uh, Middle Eastern, Asian countries, New Zealand, we're talking about Latin America, the whole diaspora of Latin America and people who were born and raised in the U.S. from who also come from those backgrounds as well, but are born and raised here. So there was always that connection, like what brings us together? What brings us together? Like the food that you have is the food that I have. The language you speak is the language that I speak. Like, I mean, a, a perfect example of that is like this discovery of my intersection with Haiti. Like hmm. um, I did not know about Haiti coming to the U.S. I know I grew up in Lebanon, you know, um, in Lebanon, we think that like, okay, we're all Lebanese. We don't think about ethnicity, race, color, all these things. You know, we're here, we're here. You know, a mm-hmm. person is white, if a person is brown or olive skin, like we're Lebanese. You know, we just, you know, we don't have that. Like we can tell if someone is Syrian, if someone's Palestinian from the accent. We can tell if someone's from the South, you know, if someone is Muslim or Christian from, you know, their right. practices. You know, race wasn't really um, a thing. And the culture was a culture. Like we welcome everyone on our table. Um, and then discovering later on that my dad's family is, uh, is from Palestine, although he was born in Kuwait and raised in Lebanon. He has Lebanese citizenship. Um, okay. But coming to the U.S. and then, um, you know, my first interaction with um, a Haitian girl, I'm actually, we were going out on a date together. And we started, she started speaks in French to me. And I'm like, tu parles français, moi je parle français aussi. Oh, c'est génial ça. Like, we were like speaking French. I'm like, wait a second. Like. I didn't expect to speak French with in America because you think America, English, American, you know, but I, but I lived in New York. So actually, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> and for me, like I've worked with, um, you know, when I worked for the Dubai market, you know, we've had partners who were, you know, West African, Congolese uh, from Ivory Coast. And we spoke French with them too, you know, but it was like a fun thing. When I came to America, why did I not have the mentality that people here also are from multiple backgrounds? So mm-hmm. we started talking about Haiti and the Lebanese people who migrated to Haiti, the Palestinians in Haiti and everything. And that triggered me to do like, you know, my DNA ancestry test, you know. Well, I used to think that people would think that I'm Puerto Rican or Dominican. So I thought maybe I have Latin in me, you know, or right. <laughs> Hispanic. But to my surprise, you know, had like Taino, Native Dominican Republic, Haitian and French and a little bit of Congolese because of slavery. I'm not going to get right. into history, but that made me think. And I told my father... And he was like, well, yeah, probably from your grandfather's side, you know, I mean, I guess so. And I'm like, well, that makes sense. This is, there's an intersection there. There's a connectivity yeah. to that culture. And I started learning Creole, but mm. all of that because I had an interaction with someone who is from a totally different background than me, but mm-hmm. our cross-cultural communication and the language we spoke made me be more in tune, made me learn another language, made me want to learn more about the food, maybe want to educate people about Lebanon and Francophony and being like, I have a lot of African, West African friends, you know, and speaking French together, talking about colonization, talking about our history, you know, dancing together, talking, laughing, the humor we share, you know, our connectivity helps us build friendships. So to the workplace, cross-cultural communication helps build friendship. And that's important. Everything starts with friendship, foundational things. And, you know, friendships are necessary in any environment, you know, um, alliances, allyship, how will you have be an ally to someone if you don't have maybe a, um, a connectivity to them? And another thing is like learning. Well, how do we, what brings us together? What is our intersection? And how do we learn about the other part beyond the intersection? 
you know. And an example can be, for example, you know, black women who were born and raised in America with, for example, Caribbean women who moved here when they were in their 20s. There's a different accent there, different, you know, culture, but blackness brings you together. Mm -hmm. And you're both black women in America, but we cannot just get stuck on black and female only. We have to expand. And I think yes. why Kimberly Crenshaw's work is so important because she later on amplified, well, we have to think about queerness and body size and language and whether you're born in the south or born in crenshaw in los angeles or mm -hmm. whether you're uh, you know west african or east african or whether you know you're darker skin or lighter skin like we have to learn about the other elements so we cannot just stuck like oh i'm arab you're arab we're good like no like you're all so i'm lebanese i need to we need to talk about these things yeah and that helps really um i think exposure and learning mm -hmm. exposure and learning because um you may not think directly learning about another culture, how it helps me in the workplace, but it helps you on the wrong run because it's critical thinking. It's critical thinking. Which they don't teach in the classroom anymore, but yeah. Exactly. And <laughs> why is critical race theory being erased in the classroom? Because it makes you think. Yeah. That's why. And let me tell you something. White supremacy doesn't want you to think. You know, corporate you know, was, don't want you to think. It was something you said just now that, that clicked for me in um you know a, a black woman from the united states and a black caribbean woman um and having that connectivity around black and womanhood but one of the things that i often see even amongst these groups and it goes back to the intersectionality but it also touches on the impact of colonization mm -hmm. on those communities mm -hmm. right because there are so many that are taught and ingrained exactly. mm -hmm. that um, how can I say this? There's levels to this, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, as a black American, you are probably lower down in some way, in some viewpoints, lower down on the scale mm. and in other viewpoints, higher up on the scale, because if you are straight from the motherland, you must be lower down, you know? So it's like yes. all of these things that are built into the system that mm -hmm. is all part of colonization All part of colonization. And, and all part of this this culture of divide and conquer, mm -hmm. you know? And so I had a conversation yesterday, um, actually a recording for this that will come out, um, that we were talking about the, the way that we have taken in white supremacy as a mm -hmm. part of who we are, Adopting as people of color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and how do you start to dismantle that? Mm -hmm. And how do you start to tell yourselves the truth mm -hmm. about who you are and in and, and the places and space that you take up, right? Exactly. And so when I think about what you're saying in the workplace, there's that layer that's mm -hmm. on over that because mm -hmm. yes, there's these friendships and there's this um, sense of community that I think, and I'll say communities of color mm -hmm. have of like, let's be communal, let's work together, let's support each other, let's, you know, this is who we are as a people, mm -hmm. yet we are in these structures that are, and the phrase I used yesterday was, you know, rugged individuality. Right. <laughs> you know, do it on your own, pull yourself up from your bootstraps. Exactly, and, exactly. You know, you, you reach the pinnacle of that all by yourself. But let's take a picture of us together so we can show the world that we're good. Like what, okay. All right. Right. So it's like I'm looking at all of this and how do you pull this apart? And so when you talk about intersectionality, it's also those intersections of ourselves that bump up against each other. And mm -hmm. how do we start to unpack why that is? Mm -hmm. Because when it I mean, the bottom, the foundation of it is is colonization and, exactly. and supremacy mindset. And so, you know, as you're you're doing this work and you talk about intersectionality beyond DEI and beyond kind of what we are taught, like you, you mentioned at the top, the very superficial surface mm -hmm. work. <clears throat> what are some of the things that come to mind when organizations or even individuals, because it's rarely organizations, it's mm -hmm. individuals within organizations yes. um, that want to take it to that next level? Like, what are some of the things that they really need to consider mm -hmm. if they're like, okay, 
we're beyond the superficialness of this. We want to go deep. What, what should they keep in mind? Well, I mean, uh, keeping in mind, but also factors like I will say one thing for sure. And I feel like people don't talk about this enough. Companies want to make money. OK, mm -hmm. if it's not bringing me any money, I don't want it, mm -hmm. you know, and I'll always give this example. And, you know, and like it might sound a little bit harsh, but, you know, in 2020, you know, when a public death of a black man has been televised for the whole world and suddenly companies have been having an awakening, what they actually realize is like, oh, we can make money off of black people. So let's do what they want us to do so we can take the money. And then whatever black people say, we'll do it because guess what? You're bringing us the income because we have a new audience. And that's more in advertising and marketing, which I feel that I worked in, but also in like tech and everything. Like it's, it's you know, um, capitalism and money. It's finance yeah. and it's greed. So there's that motive behind it. There's no motive of like, you know what? We're going to let go of our greed and actually do the work to make sure these communities are protected not just amplify, protected. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, something that I see also taking into consideration in intersectionality is like when it comes to trans awareness or awareness of like the experience of trans folks, it's always trans white people at the forefront, but mm. never trans black and brown folks at the forefront who are getting the end of it in terms of like challenges, to be honest. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's always at the comfort of whiteness. It's always at the comfort of whiteness or what is closer to making us the cash value and that's always closer to whiteness unfortunately in this country we the first thing is you know individuals people in leadership everything have to think is like let me forget about the money for one second that's the number one thing let me take that capitalistic mindset out of my brain for one mm -hmm. second which is a very difficult thing to unlearn it's an extremely difficult thing to unlearn and when you come when you're born or raised in a country like america it's kind of hard not to be capitalistic because that's because you know especially for black folks like you're displaced from the get-go you know so like this country forces you to hustle to make your income so you can survive and that's mm -hmm. the reality and that's why I give a lot of grace personally for me when I hear black folks you know being capitalistic versus white folks because I understand your background but you over here you were born on a silver spoon you need to no. you got all the privilege you need to stop doing that like you know you have no excuse for that thinking like you you cannot learn that but again you're brainwashed your bubble the bubbling mentality but just one group is more advanced than the other the other one had to scrap and scripple to survive to where they are today that's justifiable you understand that and yet that particular group or groups is willing to learn but why aren't you willing to learn you know, as yeah. a privileged white person, for example. Again, not everyone is like that. I don't mean to generalize, but it's a reality that we live in. Right. So that's number one. And number two is kind of like um, academia is nowhere to be found within individual <laughs> and uh, corporate individuals, particularly. It's like it's like school doesn't matter. It's like academia doesn't matter. It's like um, foundational yeah. studies don't matter. Well, we can't. How how do you expect me, for example? to help or be an ally to the black community if I don't understand blackness. Right. I can't do that. I can't do that. Why would I want to be an ally to someone who identifies as black or someone who identifies as Asian if I don't have a foundational understanding of their culture and their history? I do not want to do that. You know, why would I help or assist or amplify or protect, you know, trans black folks without having a foundational understanding, academic understanding of intersectionality? Mm -hmm. without understanding what they go through that's so that's number two you know having and google search is free you can search you can talk you only can, free only free <laughs> documentaries reports films yeah and excuse me having conversations about these things are very very important so educating education is liberation people don't want to educate themselves they think whatever post they see on instagram is education that's not it just because yeah. TikTok influencer told you that, that's not education. You need to go further. And excuse me, sorry, I'm a little congested. So that's all right. My nose keeps getting in the way. Um, the third thing, honestly, Sasha, which I think is also important, is cultural immersion. Mm. Like, we need to feel like number one thing is to let go of the let go of the bubble. Like, get out of the bubble. Get out of the capitalistic bubble. Break out of it. Like, have that courage to break out number two is like okay search read analyze critique and number three is actually bring them to the forefront 
Like, yeah. I saw this film. I want to talk about it. I'm interested to hear the experiences. I went to this party. I ate this food. I traveled to this country. I've seen these things. You know, like actually being an uncomfortable, and that can be uncomfortable sometimes, but we all need to be uncomfortable to learn. Mm -hmm. So if hiring managers, if the I directors, if um, inclusive leaders really want to change, they need to go through these three steps. Yeah. These three steps, you know, and then understanding, okay, we need to monetize those, but let's monet we monetize those later on. At the end, the problem is like, how do we monetize from the get go? But if right. you want to make change, you have to let go of the monetizing mentality if you really want to make change. To be honest, you know, passion yeah. first, profit later. You know, but the problem is profit first, passion later. And you know, you'll make your point, but are you going to make change? And for how long is that going to last? Yeah. That's one thing I've noticed, it doesn't last too long. Like you get lost in the crowd because you're not breaking out of the barrier. You're becoming like any other. DI professional or becoming like any other um, inclusive leader that is like not is thinking about branding and capitalization and not breaking out of the bubble and recurring topics that we've heard over and over and over and over again. And it's not going anywhere. It's not going mm -hmm. anywhere. So I think these three vital steps are a good start. At least they're big starts, but they're good to start with. They're good. Yeah. They're good. You know, and one of the things that, you know, you talked about was, and it's, I say it so often, was, you know, folks love the badge of allyship, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I'm an ally to this person. I'm an ally. And I'm like, it's not something that you can bestow upon yourself, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's a verb. It's an action that you take. And someone that is impacted needs to be the one to say, yes, you are an ally. Your actions mm -hmm. have proven to be that of an ally versus exactly. you wearing this badge. Mm -hmm. The other thing that, you know, you mentioned was that immersion. And as you were talking, you know, I had the experience and I think it was probably, it was at the time, it felt like the worst year of my life <laughs> because mm -hmm. I literally was on a plane 85% of the time, right. For, a, for a year. Wow. Okay. And I mean, yeah, I just, I couldn't even tell you what my house looked like. I lived out of a suitcase <laughs> for, for a year. And, but in that time, you know, I was able to go to the Middle East. I was able to go to Africa. I was able to go to Europe. I was able to go to all of these other places and see what diversity and inclusion look like. And so as you were talking about immersion, it wasn't just me going in with this lens, this American lens of, okay, how do we change and fix this? Mm -hmm. It was like, wow, let me sit back and really understand mm -hmm. what's going on and happening here. Exactly. Um, and one of the most profound things, you know, we were in, in Cape Town mm. and we were doing some volunteer work and there was a form that we all had to, to fill out. And one of the... Um, boxes on there said colored and folks are looking at me like well Sasha can they say that and I'm like we're in South Africa mm. this is not the American <sighs> mindset and standard of how oh. we document race and gender right mm. this is how they do it here mm -hmm. and there was just like the minds that were blown mm. because they thought okay well we just do what we do in America everywhere Every, exactly yeah you know, and so having that experience and then also kind of understanding the aftermath of apartheid and, and you know, the things that mm -hmm. were taking place and talking to people and seeing and understanding the day to day mm -hmm. interactions of folks exactly shifted my mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, absolutely blew my mind, um, you know, spending time in Latin countries and understanding the pronouns that we use here in the United States don't necessarily translate in other parts of the world, exactly. in Latin American countries or Middle mm -hmm. Eastern countries, mm -hmm. right? And so again, how do we truly think about this from a global context as practitioners? Yes. You can't do, you really can't do that work without that immersion piece. Mm -mm. Absolutely not. And so I appreciate you saying that because it does shift your mind and how you do this work, but it also allows you to 
kind of forces you a bit to yeah. take the capitalism out of it mm -hmm. and think about, okay, well, what can we do? How can we rethink what this looks like mm -hmm. from this context and not with this American lens? Of course, definitely. I'm so curious, where in the Middle East did you go? Um. Oh gosh, where were we? We were in Bahrain. Oh, Bahrain, oh my God. Like the smallest out of all the yes. Arab countries. That is the experience <laughs> yes. there. Um, so I was there for four days. Wow. It was it was interesting. Hmm. Um we went to a marketplace and I can't remember the name of it, but we went to a marketplace and one of the women that was in one of the um stores and one of the booths, she was like, You're the first black person that I've seen in a long time. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. <laughs> was, okay. she happy, was she happy saying it or was she like stunned? It was at first, I think it was stunned. Hmm. And then, you know, she was just trying, you know, selling me all the stuff. And I'm like, yeah, see, you think just because I'm I, I'm not a movie star or celebrity, <laughs> but a whole lot of money. <laughs> but you know what's funny about it is that like she directly said that and Directly. Maybe from her from her perspective, it's like she's not trying to be degrading or anything. She's like, "Oh, you're black, you're Beyonce. Let's just you want to buy some stuff like." So it's <laughs> that like innocent, innocent ignorance, if you want, like that kind of like I don't mean any harm, but, right? Hey, you're and I didn't take it are. right. I didn't take it that way, and it's so funny mm -hmm. because I think it, when we, again putting the U.S. lens on it, if somebody had come up to someone here, here. and said something similar, that's terrible. Yes, that's terrible. Right. Exactly. So context. So it's, it's, it's that context. It's absolutely mm -hmm. the context and then mm -hmm. understanding, you know, and again, coming from a family that that is very Caribbean, um, when you're only shown certain things about the United States, it formulates mm -hmm. that mindset. And when, you know, other people are only seeing certain things about the United States. Mm. It formulates a mindset. It does. It does. Um, and so, which is why I'm glad I have two passports. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> it's a privilege. It's an earned privilege. Let's it is an that. earned privilege. It is earned absolutely privilege. an earned privilege. There is nothing wrong with that because we know other people don't have passports because of that bubbling and everything. And that's fine. I always tell, um, excuse me, sorry not to go off mm -hmm. track, but you know, I always tell, um, we shouldn't be looking down at folks who do not, especially folks of culture. I say like people of culture more than people of color. I'm trying to get away from the term people of color because of its I like history. that people of culture. I'm going to write that down. I like that. Yes, because it becomes so like systemized and then everybody mm -hmm. wants to be included in without understanding the word colored at the beginning. So I just mm -hmm. like to use people of culture, make it that broad so we can be inclusive. But um yeah, we, we we can't we have to avoid looking down on our um brothers and sisters who do not have that privilege, those maybe who mm -hmm. grew up in rural southern American states and then they don't have maybe you know a, a passport or something, or even those who grew up in, like in New York and never left New York, for example. Right. Like we have to take into consideration every single person where they come from, not look down on them, you know. And yeah. I think there's something that I would like to touch on is that. Well, it's not really more cross-cultural learning more than it is like, well, hey, like I'm globally traveled. Maybe you're not. Would you like to be? Would you like to have a taste of that? And mm -hmm. I will come, not come down, but I will immerse myself in your level. And I'll give that example. Like I moved to Atlanta a year ago and Atlanta has been amazing to me. It's been mm -hmm. great. It's given me a sense of like metropolitan, but also like, you know, village, um, small town mentality. I mean, I grew up in a small village in Lebanon. And sometimes I run into people who are not familiar with my experience. They don't know and they are comfortable with their things that they do, but they're very intrigued by my experience and they're so welcoming. Mm -hmm. And that for me is something that I will take any day in comparison to someone who has traveled to 50 countries and is a freaking snob, to be honest. And I cannot handle that. Like it's not having PhDs or traveling to multiple countries and still not having a sense of humility and like being yes. humble and being welcoming is something that we need to avoid and take out of our agenda completely. Because One of my biggest, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's it. Like I just, I hate seeing it when it happens in communities of culture and yeah. the judgment between, especially between black and brown folks, because that is a disservice to our communities. 
instead of an uplift to our communities. You know, like, yeah. I mean, I don't flaunt speaking five languages everywhere I go. Like people are getting, oh my God, you speak five languages, amazing. I'm like, yeah, whatever. You know, like I still, it still took me three years to learn the electric slide. Let me tell you that. So, <laughs> I mean, yes, I speak five languages, but let me tell you, it took me three right. years. It's a balance. I did 50 lessons on black history to learn these steps. So just right. so you know, I am not that perfect or that great. You know, just, <laughs> just so you know, like you, you probably have things that are way better than like. Oh, that is hilarious. hilarious. But that's how we, but that's how we adapt to each other. It's like our strength yeah. and our willing to learn, you know, like I yeah. was willing to learn, you know, the electric slide because it's cool. It's fun. And the history of it and everything. Why aren't you interested to know why I learned Creole? Why aren't you interested to learn about, you know, the Arab Spring a little bit, for example, or how Lebanon, how the Lebanese government operates or what's happening in Palestine or, you know, Haiti as the first, like, why not? Like, I understand, you know, I'm in your country, but I gave my, like, I'm learning your history. I want to, I'm interested, I'm curious, I'm passionate. Why can't you also learn about my globality? So... Beautiful. We need to, we need yes. to we need to educate people or like force people leaders anyone to you to understand that like people need to learn from you and yes. your experience that is hyperly valid in the U.S. But you also need to learn from the global experiences that are as equally valid because that literally helps you the first step into like you know get out of that comfort zone. So I just wanted to bring that up, you know, and make sure that like this will do a great service for our communities. Yeah. And there's that openness because if we're always closed within each other and we start judging, like, oh, pff, he's doing too much because he's loud. That's a microaggression. But yeah. that's what people tell you at the job. So if another brother of yours, you know, like, you know, just because they act, look, behave different, your comment is like, he's doing too much or she's doing too much or they're doing too much. We don't understand that. That's a microaggression. Yeah. We don't realize that we microaggress each other sometimes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, what I was going to jump in and say, I said one of my biggest pet peeves is when I'm traveling the world mm. and I'm just like, oh, that's an American acting so American. <laughs> because, <laughs> again, it, it's not, it's, it's the yeah. expectation that because just because I'm in another country doesn't mean that I have to abide by those rules. And I saw it so much, especially during COVID mm. where people were traveling and, you know, the country had certain laws that may have been different than what they were here. Mm -hmm. And people having this expectation like, Oh, okay, well, I'm just going to do what America says or does. <laughs> and I'm like, and that's probably why you're going to end up in jail. Because <laughs> you're not in America now. So anyway, that was that's one of my pet peeves. Well, you know, it's so interesting. You, you mentioned that because, um, like, let's let's uncover that actually, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. uh, Sasha, can we talk about that a little bit? Sure. So, I mean, when you travel as an American or anybody, when you travel to another country, you have to also understand that, like, there's norms, there's rules, there's regulations that you have to respect. Like, if, when I come to the U.S. I don't want to pay taxes. Why are you taking money out of my paycheck? Right. But guess what? I have to pay my taxes because yep. that's the legal thing to do. Do I want to do it? No. Do I want to pay for my insurance? No. It's supposed to be free because I'm used to that being free. Like what? But I have to do it. Yeah. You have to buy a police officer stops me. I'm all like on the wheel, even though I don't identify as black, but like I know I'm in a country where this can get me in trouble. And I will make sure that I will not do anything that will skip that, you know, like mm -hmm. go over that authority because I understand how this country operates. So when you go to another country and you want to act out and wild out and think because, you know, and then your ass gets thrown in jail and then people say like, oh, they're discriminating. I'm like, actually, well, um, that's you another country. You broke right. the law regardless of your skin color. Let's be very honest about that. Because Regardless, right. Let me tell you, Dubai and Abu Dhabi, there's rules of protection against discrimination. You cannot discriminate against us. You cannot do that. If somebody sees you attacking a person because they're black, like you go to jail for that. You go mm -hmm. to jail for that. That's like, you cannot. There's so many systems and rules. And, um, you know, even in like, you know, countries that are like, for example, um, you know, not necessarily queer friendly, you know, we can't change that, unfortunately. And it sucks because, like, yeah. queerness is liberation and should be liberation in every single country around the world. But unfortunately, 
there are countries that amplify a certain liberal narrative or sense of freedom, but do not amplify another sense of freedom. Yeah. You know, and when you go there and if they tell you, for example, you cannot put the rainbow flag on your as a T-shirt because you're thrown in jail. You know, yes, that's horrible for you to go to jail or be, right. you know, condemned for putting that. I would and I would totally go against that against that government. But here's the thing. We can't do anything about it because it's their laws. Yes, Unfortunately, their laws. we have to diminish our voice and understanding that, you know, um, um, the rainbow has become, you know, a sense of like, you know, pink washing and commercialism, you know, in America with pride and everything like, you know, we show that that's liberation, but our trans black brothers, sisters, and individuals are still getting killed. Yeah. They don't have that liberation in their own country here. So yeah. if we think about liberation and what you can do in other countries, well, the United States still doesn't give us a sense of liberation that we want, you know? So why are we quick to critique other countries where yeah. we should be critiquing what's happening, you know, like Roe versus Wade and the Supreme Court and, you know, um, affirmative action that are like very dangerous to black and brown communities, you know, but mm -hmm. you're mad because you went to Dubai and there's no, you can't hold, you know, your partner who's from the same gender. Right. You can't hold hands. Well, let, let's talk about it. You know, it is what it is. And, you know, this is not mean to say like, you know, I'm a person, you know, who um, is a huge advocate for queerness, huge advocate for queerness and queer liberation. It's very important, but we can do these things, you know, like you cannot drink on the streets, for example, in America, you want to drink all the time on the street, whatever, all of that stuff. You can't do that in other countries. You have to respect right. these laws. So we really have to take into consideration that we cannot judge other countries. Well, we don't have to go to the other countries knowing that, you know, right. um, we have to understand what's happening in certain, you know, African countries in terms of, women, of like queer liberation or, yeah. you know, like um, um, women rights as well. And all of that, like, you know, women rights, queer liberation, trans protection, all of these things and even, you know, countries that are whether safe or not safe for, you know, for for black people as well. Yeah. You know, um, understand United States. <laughs> yes, the UK, Canada, like, <laughs> right, you know, but the minute you go to, for example, Chile and people want to touch your hair because they're fascinated, it is a sense of anti blackness if you think about it, because the world yeah. we live in is very anti black, but that is not causing your harm, that is just ignorance. While, right, be in the UK as an American shopping, someone like I see you shoplifting, that could cause you harm. So are we taking that into consideration? Why are we viewing right. um, cosmopolitan countries as liberation and right. colonized countries as harm? Looking at Jamaica as harm, looking at Haiti as harm, looking at Chile, looking at um, Colombia. Yeah. I mean, well, Colombia is becoming very touristic, you know, in certain parts, but like, you know, Egypt, while not understanding that like, well, we have to adapt to our environment. We have to yeah. adapt to our environment. Everything needs requires adaption, code switching, understanding, you know, we're not free until we're fully free. And this world, unfortunately, is not fully free. I mean, maybe, I don't know, New Zealand, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I've heard they have a good over there. You can be free, do whatever you want, maybe. I don't know. But no country yeah. is fully going to give you your full sense of liberation. That's why we have communities. That's why we have yeah. conversations, you know. Bringing your authentic self to work or to a country is a myth. Absolutely. Oh gosh. It, 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 yeah. Well, first of all, I'm always like, you really don't want me to bring my full self to work. That's, mm. You're not going to be able to handle it. But <laughs> um, you know, it, it's one of those things where, you know, even though we're, we're talking kind of in general, as you're talking, it's things that organizations, it's individuals and leaders within organizations need to keep in mind if they're sending people to other countries for work or yes. they're, you know, they're, they have other teams that are part of other you know, that are, are in other locations outside of headquarters. You know, all of these things need to be taken into consideration, not just with HR policies and procedures, but how you operate, how you um, have people be a part of meetings. You know, all of that is what makes, um, you know, creating these inclusive cultures in the workplace so important. Mm -hmm. um, I want to do a bit of a pivot. Yes. Because I mean, we, we can talk for days on this. <laughs> Um, what are the things that you do to, to fill your cup? Like, how do you take care of yourself in this mm -hmm. work? Because, I mean, you have about 80 jobs, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Oh my God. Like a, take care of yourself. Like a true Lebanese or a true Jamaican, as they say. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> this is why me and my Jamaican brothers, we get along very well. Well, I mean, we have multiple jobs. We do everything. <laughs> I yeah, love all it. the things. And we can joke about that. The thing is that because, you know, we understand without like, you know, stereotyping because we can, again, cult cross-cultural connections. Yes. Are there, um, well, um, I sleep. I make sure to sleep. I believe in sleeping and drinking lots of water. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. important. By 12, 11, 30, 12, I'm in bed. I want to get my seven, eight hours of sleep. I don't believe in continuing work until 8 p.m. No, I detach completely. My life is not surrounded around my work and is not centered around my work. Um, uh, my high social, my high intelligence is social uh, mm. and interpersonal intelligence. So I like to be around people. I like to um, go out and just like have fun and just like forget about the work and just, you know, release. I'll let you fly. <laughs> that amongst other dances that I've learned, you know, we evolved. Yeah, like, we're evolving. Like, you know. Yeah. There's a lot of things. Oh my god, I can't tell you about the um, uh what's it called? Beyonce's song um uh before before I let go. Was it no oh, yeah. I let go? Mm -hmm. I'm still trying to learn the Tamiya dance, so oh my yeah. god. <laughs> I, I have to focus on I have to focus on that. <laughs> I have rhythm, don't get me wrong, but like when it comes to black it's American dance activities, I'm like, I really have to focus because like <laughs> I put my eyes on this, like how like, I'm not born into your culture, like you you have the you have the DNA to like quickly go into it and step into that. I have to observe. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but, um, and I, you know, I, I travel, I travel, I travel for, ple for pleasure, like in just immersing myself, going to Airbnbs, like, mm -hmm. um, Car to Caribbean countries mostly, but also like, you know, to other countries on my own, because I like to immerse myself. I don't do it for work. I mean, it's going to be a research regardless, but just to be in another place outside of the U.S. is a sense of relief and breath of fresh yeah. air. I go back home to Lebanon once a year, see my family. It you know rejuvenates me. It gives me the energy that I want. It helps me release. We need that. Stepping out of your bubble, you know, is very important. Um, um, working out is important. Being physically active, just breathing mm -hmm. and being physically active, is so necessary. You know, uh, for my mental health as well. Um, and sometimes just like, you know, doing activities like cooking or like, you know, cleaning just to like, you know, as form of therapy, you know, therapy comes in different ways. Um, yeah. um, those are to relax and release. But also, you know what, at the same time, like, you know, what fuels me to do the work more is also um, research. Mm. It's like seeing an article and learning about it or like an artist produced a piece of art. What does it mean and everything? And like, what's the history behind it? Mm. I really, I have this interest of like, you know, um, that I do sometimes is like celebrities. I kind of research their cultural backgrounds and how their parents met, you know, like I discovered Zoe Saldana as Puerto Rican, Dominican, Lebanese, and Haitian, you know, from her family's side. I'm like, okay, how did that come to place? Let's look into right. it. Who is right. she born? What happened? Okay, let's see the intersection of that. Christian, Catholic, you know, like, I mean, I think like <laughs> it's a fun intersectionality activity, to be honest, but I do it because it's fun. It's actually fun. It's fun to, you know, well, you, you, you yeah. find joy in learning and that, that, that I think is, is the essence of, of what it is, right? It's, exactly. it's learning in, on different levels and mm -hmm. from people and from experiences and, you know, and of course the academia, but th there's, there's that joy in learning. And I, there I, Mm -hmm. So if folks wanted to get in touch with you, Jod, mm -hmm. Jod Evangelo. Um, <laughs> with, the, with, the, with, the, with the wave. <laughs> it's the dancer in me. Um, <laughs> what is the best way for them to do that? Definitely um, my email uh, is there, jada at .com, but also, you know, on LinkedIn uh, and Instagram. Um, I mean, I'm the only name in the world that's called Jad Evangelo, so you will never find anyone in that world with that name that, that i think the beauty of that name is like it's the only name in the world so even if you google search jad evangelo jad hyphen is hy hy hyphen it, i always don't know how to pronounce hyphen. it hyphen hyphen yes such a hard word <laughs> so hard <laughs> so if you just like research it you will find my website you will find my contact information you will find my instagram and um yeah i think um that's if people want to reach out have conversations and you know Carry on the work. Wonderful. John Evangelo, thank you so much for your time today and just all of the nuggets that you've dropped. Um, I think that there's so much 
that we can learn from just really looking at this work from a more intersectional and global perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and the things that we can do as individuals to step out, like you said, step out of our own bubbles and really experience um, what is happening around mm -hmm. us because it just gives us such a different perspective mm -hmm. of things. Absolutely. So thank you so much. Thank for, you, for Sasha. Questions. Thank you. And you're absolutely welcome. And thank you all for joining us for this episode of DEI After Five. Again, I hope that you were able to walk away with a nugget or two that um, would really sit with you and, and it will help you on your journeys as you continue to do this work. Uh, you can find us here every Tuesday at 5.15 p.m. Eastern on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast. Um, and be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And until next time, have a good one.